Welcome accounting boffins, you with Ashraf Patel and the team. Yes, we're busy with VAT, but we have a different spin on VAT today because we're looking at VAT with respect to ethics and internal control, right? Remember what we said? Any business must ensure that we have ethics and internal control. So therefore, let's take a look at this here. Ask yourself the question, why are business ethics important in accounting? And this is where we then refer you to what we call the King Code, right? What is the King Code all about? It explains to you about integrity, about transparency, and a whole lot of other factors. And this is where it shows that it is important for every business to make sure that they have ethics in place. Right? But as we go on, you will see how this crops up very often in business. And yes, to do the ethical thing, to do the right thing, although nobody is watching you, is so important, not only in life, but in business as well. So, when, with respect to VAT now, we've spoken quite about, uh, a lot about internal control and about input and your output VAT. Now remember... We, like I said, we're bringing in a different component with regards to VAT. That means these two components where we talk about the ethics and we talk about the internal control. This is something that will feature in question papers in the exams. So what is important for you as a learner to remember is other than the calculations of VAT, there are other aspects of VAT that you need to be okay with. Okay, it is very important that there should be honesty and transparency in recording all transactions. Remember, as a VAT vendor, you are acting as an agent on behalf of SARS. Clearly you can see how important your role function is because you're collecting money from the end user in the form of output VAT, and that money obviously, after you've claimed your input, has to be paid over to SARS. You can see the element of honesty, transparency, featuring when we're doing the section on VAT. For example, your VAT records to be made available to interested parties. Clearly, you can have a situation where SARS does an investigation into your business to ensure that you are compliant with your VAT returns, to, to ensure that you are doing what you are supposed to be doing, to ensure that the monies that you've collected after you've claimed your input are being paid over to SARS. Remember we're talking about honesty and transparency? What are examples of unethical behavior. The business understates its sales to show a lower amount on the VAT form so that it will not pay so much to SARS. Clearly, clearly, this is unethical. This is actually fraud and it is part of tax evasion. Meaning what? It says here, what, watch what this business, business is doing. The business understates its sales amount. That means it shows a lower amount for sales. Obviously, you know that when you are doing your calculations and if you show a lesser amount for sales, it means, therefore, that the lesser output VAT there is. Because remember, your VAT rate of 15% is going to be calculated on your sales amount. So if you decrease your sales amount or you understate your sales amount, you are reducing the amount that is payable to SARS. Clearly, unethical behavior and, like I said, it, 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 it is fraud, it is a crime. It is part of tax evasion. And what do we know? We know that tax evasion is illegal. Remember, punishable by law, it's a crime you can serve jail time for it, and obviously fines could be imposed on the business. Another example would be claiming 
an amount of VAT when you are not entitled to it. Think about it. You're claiming input VAT on a particular expense which you are not entitled to claim. Remember, there are many ways in which people can try to defraud SARS. At the end of the day, if you, if you engage in such activity, it would, it would form part of tax evasion, and therefore, like I said, it's a crime and punishable in terms of the law. Let's look at another form of tax evasion, which we know we've said that it is illegal, right? Failure to pay over VAT is an offense. Remember, VAT is enacted by an act of parliament. It is something that the entire country is subjected to VAT. Because you, take yourself, when you go into a business and you buy an item which is either which is not zero rated or exempted, you are paying the VAT to that VAT vendor. So the VAT vendor then has to pay that VAT that they've collected from you after they've claimed the input VAT. That amount needs to be paid over to SARS. So clearly you can see that if this is not the case, this would mean that this would form part of tax evasion. We said it is illegal Tax evasion is illegal, and remember, it is a, it is a criminal offence, right? It is a criminal offence not to pay over the amounts that are due to SARS. Another, we're looking at, we're, we're, remember, we're looking at all the items that would fall within the ambit of tax evasion or illegal uh, transactions. For example... Tax evasion, we've said, is illegal. Look, look at this example here. Charging VAT on exempt items is also fraudulent, right? So if a business, it has to ensure that when it has a, the cash register system, they, they must make provision for tax exempt items or zero rated items. So therefore, you as Joe Consumer, when you get your till slip, make sure that any items that are zero rated, for example, we spoke about this in our previous lessons, milk, bread, etc., make sure that there's no VAT charged on those items. Because if a business does that, obviously what you can clearly see, it is part of them being dishonest. It is illegal for them to charge you VAT on zero rated items. So in that case, if they are doing that, what are they doing? They're charging you VAT, but obviously they're not going to pay over that VAT to SARS because they would claim that this would be zero-rated sales. So you, as a consumer, it is important that you check your toll slip to make sure that no VAT is levied against zero-rated items. Coming back to our point, what did we say? We said honesty, transparency. With regards to all transactions, not necessarily only VAT. Yes, we're dealing with VAT right now. But generally, it is important in any business for them to have ethics in place. And this ethic means that we are honest and transparent in our dealings. So therefore, if we have to summarize this here, what would we say? Measures that a business needs to put into place to develop an ethical culture that guides the actions of all employees. It is so important. It is, it is fundamental to success in any business that we are honest in our operations. Because remember, our honesty, our ethics is going to affect our consumers. It's going to impact on our consumers, and you will find that you as a consumer would always say, but that business always has excellent ethics in place. And obviously, this will then increase the goodwill of this business, meaning people will look up to this business and say, this is the business we would like to engage with. So, all of this would fall within the ambit of internal control as well. When we're talking about internal control, what are we saying? We're looking at 
safeguarding the assets of a business. Now, obviously, part of the assets of a business would be our bank amount, our stock amount, and all of these, as you can see, would in some way or the other be impacted if we operate unethically. Because remember, if we are caught out not to be submitting our returns to SARS, it's gonna, we're going to have negative publicity for the business. You're going to start losing consumers. And therefore, the business will definitely suffer. So therefore, what we're saying is that make sure that we have all our ducks in a row when it comes to our returns for VAT and all matters relating to VAT. Okay, so in this segment of the lesson, basically what we have done is we've looked at all the ethical and internal control measures that are applicable when dealing with VAT. We gave you examples of unethical behavior, but I'm sure you want to know more about VAT, so the place to be is with us. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll continue with our lesson on VAT. See you just now. Welcome back, Accounting Boffins. Remember, we're busy with VAT. Let's go do a quick recap on all the concepts that we have discussed so far. Firstly, we deal with input VAT. Remember, this is the VAT that we pay and we claim back from SARS, right? Then you have output VAT. That's the VAT that we collect from the consumer and we then pay it over to SARS. Now remember, a business acts as a VAT vendor, meaning they act as an agent on behalf of SARS. So yes, they pay VAT, but they claim back VAT in the form of input VAT, and they pay back to SARS in the form of output VAT. Okay, then we dealt with items that are zero rated, meaning these items have a VAT rate of 0%. Understand that. The VAT rate is at 0%, meaning that at any one time, the Minister of Finance can change that to the standard rate, knowing full well that the standard rate of VAT is 15%. Okay? Then also, remember, VAT is subjected to, to both goods and services. However, there are some items that would fall within the category of exempted. So VAT exempted items are items that will never ever have VAT levied on that particular expense. Remember we, talk, we spoke about bank services, etc., etc. So think about this in terms of all the questions surrounding VAT. Okay. Then in our previous segment, we brought in another component of VAT where we spoke about VAT with, with regards to internal control and with regards to ethics. Okay, let's move on now and look at other concepts on internal control as it affects our VAT account. One, the amount on the VAT return should be checked against the general ledger to ensure that it was correctly transferred. Remember, we submit a VAT return to SARS, but obviously this is then checked against our ledger accounts in order to ensure that the correct amount is being paid over to SARS, okay? As you go on, as you go on with accounting and you deal with VAT in more detail, you'll find that we actually do a VAT control account which actually tells you what's the input VAT and what's the output VAT, and then obviously the final amount that is either owed to SARS or SARS owes us. All the amounts on the VAT return should be recalculated to ensure that it is correct. Obviously, we said we want to make 100% sure 
that our, our VAT return is correct. So therefore, we will check against other information to ensure that our VAT return is in fact correct before we submit it to SARS. All payments to SARS must be done through electronic bank transfers. Remember, we spoke about EFTs, electronic fund transfers, okay? So all payments that are made to SARS are made via EFTs. By the same token, an independent person must compare the VAT return with the payment request. So, let's, let's get the order correct. One person completes your VAT return. It is then submitted to a senior manager to ensure that everything there is correct, right? Thereafter, once that procedure is finalized, we now make the transfer, and this is done by an EFT. Here again, you have control measures in place. That means one person will process the payment via the EFT, and another person, also in management, will then release the payment to SARS. So you can see that there are controls in place. We also talk here about division of duties. We ensure that not one person does everything because obviously if that happens, it, it could lead itself to some kind of fraud or dishonesty. So when you have division of duties, you have one person checking on the other person to ensure that we safeguard the asset of the business, namely our bank figure. We don't want to pay too much to SARS, which we don't have to pay, and neither do we want to defraud SARS by paying too little. Here we go. Two people should authorize the electronic payment, right? Just one, one person sets up the electronic payment, allocates the payment, and another person then releases it. You could also have, depending on the size of the enterprise, Right? There could also be two release uh, people in charge of releasing the payment. That means first release and second release. Obviously, all of this will be de dependent on the type of business, the size of the business. And obviously, in a smaller business, we have to ensure that although it's a smaller business, there has to be division of duties. Another important factor, right? other than division of duties, is rotation of duties. Now, clearly, that's a difference. When we mean, what do we mean by rotation of duties? By rotation of duties, we mean that we change people's duties as and when the need arises. In this way, a person doesn't become too, co too comfortable in a position and then obviously feels that they can do something untoward. What we do is we ensure that we rotate duties and in this way people know that there, are, there is a check on them by management. In very large businesses, obviously, you have some one person who is responsible for VAT input and somebody for VAT output. Obviously, if the, the, like I said earlier on, depending on the size of the enterprise, you could have one person only dealing with the input section of your VAT. You could have another person dealing with the output section of your VAT. So in this way, control is kept. You also have division of duties. There's control to ensure that all our VAT records are in order. So when it comes to the final payment, everything will be hunky-dory and we can then make the necessary payment to SARS. Obviously, all of this, there will be somebody to oversee this entire process. It would be the role function of somebody in management to ensure that the VAT payments are done correctly. Obviously, when you're looking at the VAT in terms of the input and the output and the calculations, obviously that is done by a lower level of management. But the final payment, which is done at senior level of management, obviously would be either the business's accountant or somebody in, 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 a, in a very senior position in management. What I'm trying to emphasize here for you guys is that remember, in all of these processes, you have certain people in charge of the ultimate payment. 
And that is done taking into consideration that everybody has performed their duties correctly. The internal auditor or the owner could conduct spot checks on the calculation of VAT input and VAT output to, pre to prevent the fraud. Certainly, remember, an internal auditor is there to ensure that the internal control processes of every business is in order. Right, so that's the internal auditor. An internal auditor is appointed by the business works for the business, but ensures that all our processes are in place, and therefore the internal auditor can at, at randomly do a check to see, let me check on the VAT input, let me check on this expense, let me check on the VAT output, let me check on my cash sales, let me look at my zero rated sales, let, let me look at my exam sales. So all of these could be done either by the owner or the internal auditor, depending on the size and nature of the enterprise. What else will the internal auditor do? Ensure that VAT due to SARS is paid on the due date and to check the tax return. Right, so this is important. We have to comply by certain time frames. With regards to VAT, Whenever we are doing our VAT, we have to ensure that it is done timelessly. Because if this is not done timelessly, you're going to have a penalty that is imposed by SARS unnecessarily. Why do we have to pay for something which we have ready and we can submit on time? So all of these processes would fall within the ambit of the internal auditor or whoever else is in charge of that particular process. The internal auditor or the owner should ensure that the auditing firm that handles the business's books is well accredited and free from corruption. Very, very, very important. Remember, with regards to our internal auditor, who is employed by the company, works for the company. Right, when it comes to the external auditor, the external auditor obviously works independent of the business, right? The external auditor, again, depending on the, uh, the enterprise and the nature of the enterprise and the size of the enterprise, that you may need, remember when it comes to companies, it's compulsory to have an external auditor. But yes, you could have a business that determines, okay, let's just appoint an external auditor to just to check whether our VAT processes are in order. That person would obviously work outside the business come in and do an inspection on our VAT processes to ensure that everything is in order. One may ask, why is that necessary? Because we want to ensure that we are 100% compliant when it comes to our returns with regards to VAT. Okay, so again, what have we done in this segment? We've looked at all the processes that need to be in place. Now, you may be asking the question, why so much of emphasis on this aspect of VAT? It is very, very important that whatever we do with regards to VAT, we must always ensure that our business is 100% compliant and our records are in order and we are doing what is necessary to be done. Okay? We're going to take a quick break. When you come back, we're going to do actual questions on VAT to expose you to possible types of examination questions. Let's take a quick breather. We'll see you just now. Welcome back, Accounting Boffins. Right, we're busy with VAT. Let's do a recap of what we've done so far. Number one, remember when we're talking about VAT, we're talking about when we're talking about VAT, we're talking about value added tax. Because very often you ask candidates, 
What does VAT stand for? And sometimes you'll be surprised they don't actually know that. It's a value added tax. Right. At this chart, it's important to mention that to you. Okay. Now, the standard rate of VAT in South Africa is 15%. Right? So that's our rate of VAT. We said that VAT is levied on goods as well as services. Right? Okay. Then... Within the category of goods, you get some goods that are zero rated, meaning the VAT rate is 0%. And this is something very often candidates tend, tend to forget. It means that there is VAT levied on zero rated items, but the rate of VAT is 0%. Okay? Now, once again, depending on the needs of the country, depending on the state of the economy, there could be items that could be moved into the zero-rated basket, okay, if and when the, the need arises, or there could be a situation where goods are taken out of the zero-rated basket into the standard rate. So think about it in, in terms of two baskets. General standard rate, 15%, and the zero-rated basket has a rate of 0%. Okay? An example of that would be bread, milk, your vegetables, etc. Again, it is there to look after the needs of the people in the economy. Okay, now you come to another category, and that is your VAT exempted. Now, this one here, okay, let's just do this here. This one here is your VAT exempted. What does this mean? This one means that you will never, ever have VAT levied against that service. School fees, etc. We've dealt with it in detail in previous lessons. So just go through that list again to make sure that you know which items or which services would fall under your VAT exempted. Right? We also mentioned fuel. Right? And I, if, if I remember correctly, I asked you to do some research on the fuel levy where you would find out what is the fuel levy that you're paying as a consumer. So remember, fuel as well is not subjected to VAT because it has its own levy that is charged against fuel. And I'm sure it made some interesting reading when you, when you did your research on the fuel levy. Right, then we said we have what is called a VAT control account, right? Now, this is obviously the account that has two components to it. What are the two components? One is your VAT input. You all know that that's the VAT that we have paid. When I say we, I'm talking of the business that is registered as a VAT vendor. Right. So all the VAT that we have paid would fall in the category of input VAT. It means a business has paid the VAT, it can claim it back from SARS. Okay, then you have your VAT output, okay, and your VAT output is all the VAT that the VAT vendor has collected on behalf of SARS, okay? So therefore, if we've collected on behalf of SARS and we claim back the input that we have paid out, that amount, the difference between that will tell us either what we owe SARS or what SARS owes us. Okay, so that basically is a summary of the VAT that we have discussed so far. Let's take a look at these questions here. One, explain the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. Right, very interesting question. Tax avoidance and tax evasion. Okay, what do we know about it? One, what's the difference between the two? Tax avoidance, accounting boffins, is legal ways of reducing the tax liability. Okay? Just to give you an example. If a company is involved with corporate social responsibility, right, they can use certain expenses, which they've paid for, as a tax deduction. Now, this is what we refer to as tax avoidance. 
perfectly legal. It's legal ways which a business can use to reduce its tax obligations to SARS, right? However, when, we de when we're dealing with tax evasion, tax evasion, people, is illegal. It is not paying the tax that you are liable to pay. Now, obviously, this is not only applicable to SARS in terms of VAT, but it's also applicable to other forms of taxation. You, as a salaried earner, there are certain deductions that are allowed for you when you're doing your PAYE. But if you are registered for PAYE and you do not submit your tax return as a consumer, as, as a citizen rather, in South Africa, then that is tax evasion. But when you claim back certain expenses on your tax return, for example, contributions to investments, etc., your medical aid contributions, and obviously there's a few more, then you as Joe Citizen, if you're claiming back those expenses and then paying your, your amount that you, pay, that you have to pay to SARS, that's tax avoidance, which is perfectly legal, absolutely in order. But if you as Joe Citizen does not submit a tax return to SARS based on your PAYE, that would fall within the category of tax evasion. That is illegal and therefore it's a criminal offense which you could be imprisoned for. Right. The question says, the owner insisted to claim VAT output on all sales, zero rated sales included, because he will pay less to SARS. Advise. Right. Look at the question. The question says, the owner insisted to claim VAT output on all items. Obviously, you know that this would form part of tax evasion. You cannot claim back input tax on zero rated items. Why? Because you are not submitting, you're not collecting tax on the output VAT of zero rated items. That is why it is zero rated. So by the same token, you can't claim back the input VAT on items that you've bought that are zero rated. So tax evasion, it is illegal and unethical to charge a VAT on zero rated items, this is fraud and the owner can be charged. Understand this, when you are buying zero rated items as a VAT vendor, you're not paying any VAT on it. By the same token, when you're selling zero rated items, you cannot charge VAT on it because the item is zero rated. So therefore, not all sales will be subjected to VAT output and not all purchases will be subjected to VAT input, depending on whether it falls within the basket of the standard rate or within the basket of your zero rated items. Remember, we alluded to that earlier on in our lesson. Is VAT paid on all items? Explain. Clearly, you can see that your answer is no. VAT is not paid on what? On zero rated items, okay? Obviously, I, I, we've, we, we've mentioned this earlier, whenever you, say a business is selling bread, so if that business buys bread to resell, they're not paying VAT on it, so there's no input VAT. Also, you get VAT exempted items. Items, for example, we said that as with school fees, you will find that on your school fee statement, there's no VAT, meaning it is an exempted item. There's no VAT attached to that item. Next question. The average turnover of Tabo traders is 240,000 Rand per annum. The company is not registered for VAT. Remember we said? Uh, that amount can change from time to time, but I think currently it's about a million rand, where it is compulsory to register. Below a million rand, you can apply for voluntary registration. Right, okay, now, explain if it is compulsory for the company to register for VAT as a VAT vendor. The answer obviously is no, because 
we know that we said a million rand is the minimum or the amount that you have to register if you have a turnover of a million rand. The company can register voluntarily. The threshold for compulsory registration is a million rand. And voluntary, it must be more than 50,000. So let's look at this question again. Because the business had a turnover of 240,000 rand, it, it's not compulsory because the threshold is a million rand. And because it's over 50,000 rand, it can register for voluntary registration as a vet vendor. Okay, so keep that in mind. The average turnover we've mentioned was 240,000 rand. Explain if the business would benefit if it registered as a vet vendor. Right, so another question now. The question now is, if this business, which is not compulsory for you to register, wishes to do voluntary registration, what, how will it impact? Will the business benefit from being registered as a vet vendor? And the answer is yes. Why? The company would benefit by claiming input VAT on goods, purchases, and expenses incurred. Remember, if the business does not register as a VAT vendor, then that business is going to be paying the VAT, but cannot claim it back. Think of that, right? The business is paying the VAT because obviously it's, it's seen as an end user. But if the business is registered as a VAT vendor, it means therefore that the business will pay the VAT, but can claim it back from SARS. So therefore you can clearly see that if a company, this particular company, the fact that the, the, the turnover was 240,000 per annum, right? We said, just to recap, it's not compulsory because the threshold is a million. But if it registers for voluntary uh, registration, that means it now becomes a VAT vendor, this would then assist in that they would be able to claim the input VAT on goods that have been purchased, and they can also claim the input on expenses that have been incurred. Right, we come to a calculation now. It says here, goods are sold for 5,460 to a debtor, right? A 15% trade discount was given. Calculate the VAT amount due on this transaction. Right, step number one. We sold goods for 5,460, but we had given the, the debtor a trade discount, okay? Just a little bit about trade discount. Remember, trade discount is calculated on the invoice price, is not recorded, and that is important. Trade discount is calculated on the invoice, but is never ever recorded. Therefore, step number one, the first thing you're going to do is to work out our amount, which is 5,460, let's do that times the 15%, which was the VAT amount, uh, not the VAT amount, sorry, the discounted price, the trade discount, okay? And that will give you a figure of 819, okay? So now we take the 5460, 5460 minus the 819, and that will give us an amount of 4641. What is the 4641? The 4641 is now the net invoice price, meaning after you've worked out the trade discount, you now have the net invoice price is 4641. Right, next step, what do we now do? Now we work out the VAT on that figure, and this is what we do. 4641 times the 15%, and this will give you your VAT amount, which is 69615. There we go. There's your VAT amount of 69615. In other words, you took your net invoice price and then you charged the 15% VAT on that amount to give you your VAT amount of 69615. Okay. Next calculation. A debtor estimate 
has not paid his account for the last two years, the business decided to write off the debt of 864 so that the business can claim the VAT amount back. Calculate the VAT amount on the bad debt written off. Clearly, the person has not settled the debt. Now remember, let me just take you back one step. When the goods were sold to the debtor, at that point already, because we're using the invoice basis, we're saying that we, we already at that point told SARS that we owe you money on the output VAT. But because we're not receiving that money, the debtor's account is now being written off as irrecoverable. We can now claim back the bad debt from SARS. Can you see? Very fair, because the debt is not paying us. And because the debt is not paying us, it is not fair for us to pay it over to SARS. Therefore, we can claim it back as an input. Okay, let's look at the calculation. Calculation of the VAT written off. And this is very, very, very important. Whenever you are doing your VAT calculations, keep this in mind. 15 over 115. What am I referring to? I am referring to when we want to calculate the VAT amount and we know the amount is inclusive of VAT. If that is a situation, we use the 15 over 115. As is the example here, let's do the example. So we know now that the amount that we write, the, the amount of the debt is 864. So it's 864 times 15 divided by 115. And the amount is, clearly you can see, 11269. Don't concern yourself with the rounding off. We'll accept 11269 as the amount that we can claim back from SARS. Now look at what we've done. The first important part of the calculation was the fact that we used 15 over 115. Let me explain that because of its importance. 15% is the VAT amount, right? And included in this total amount that the debtor owes us is the 115. Where does this 115 come from? It comes from the 100% plus the 15% of VAT. Clearly you can see, there we go, right? So when you're doing your calculation, you want to extract the VAT amount, right? You've got the total amount inclusive, you want to extract the VAT amount, therefore you take the 15 over the 115, like we did here, there's it. So your actual calculation was 864 times 15 divided by 115. Yeah, there's your calculation to give you the VAT amount of 112.69. This tells you now that the VAT that you can claim back from SARS would be 112.69. Okay, guys. So you could see in this particular segment of our lesson, we concentrated on possible examination questions. If we have to summarize... What is important for you to take from this lesson? When you are doing a VAT calculation, if the amount that is given to you is inclusive of VAT, make sure that you use, depending on what you want, obviously. If you want your VAT amount, you're always going to take 15 over 115. If you want the sales amount only, that means you then take the 100 over 115. Now, the, 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 the challenge, or rather, the important thing to remember here is that in your denominator, you always use the 115 because it includes your VAT. So it's 100 plus the 15 to give you 115. So these formula that we use to calculate VAT are very, very important. To recap, one, if you want your VAT amount, it's 15 over 115 if it is inclusive. But if it is exclusive, then simple, it will, it will be the amount of the sale times the 15%. But when it is inclusive, it includes the 15%. Therefore, 15 over 115 will give you the VAT amount. 
If you want the sales amount, it will be, if it's inclusive, it will be 100 over 115. Okay, guys, from me, Ashraf Patel, and the team, I think we've done a lot of work on VAT today. Please make sure that you work through your past papers, through activities, which will then make sure that you understand how to go about doing your calculations of VAT. Also remember, not only the calculations, but the ethical considerations and the internal, considera internal control considerations as well. From me, Ashraf Patel and the team, keep your feet on the ground, reach for the stars, because you definitely are a shining star. Until next time, goodbye.